<laughs> oh, cool. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to say welcome uh, to the events today. Um, for those of you who doesn't know me yet, my name is Kashfi. Um, you can just call me Cash, uh, just like money. It's easier for everyone to remember anyway. So I'm part of the team of Slash, and right now I'm located in Bali at the moment. Um, just out of curiosity, um, like from all of the people who are coming here today, where are you guys coming from? Um, you can drop on the chat on where are you based right now at the moment. That would be awesome. Um, so yeah, before we start, and while we're still waiting for the others as well to coming in, um, thank you so much everyone for joining for this event. As you know that today, our speaker, Andres, uh, which one of the founder of uh, Slash as well, he will share a little bit of his insight actually around venture building. So if this is something that you're, uh, that you're interested with, and I'm pretty sure that you are because you are here anyway. Um, so it's going to be very interesting. He will give you a lot of tools and a lot of insights as well from his experience. Um, and yeah, so just looking up to the chat right now. So I saw a couple of people from Singapore, Bali, of course, Andres, you are here. <laughs> uh, we have Cambodia, okay. Cambodia, but living in the UK. Awesome. Uh, Armenia, hi Fahagen. Um, so yeah, uh, today we will cover about the topic. And uh, since we're still waiting for uh, the other uh, two coming in as well, um, it's always nice to catching up with you guys a little bit. Um, so maybe we, is it okay, Andres, if I invite a couple of our guests to just introduce yeah, sure. And then kind of like want to know a little bit what are their expectations coming into Yeah, the, we're also then, we're also anyway, just still I think let's give probably there's a more people joining all the time. So maybe let's give another couple of minutes anyway. Yeah. So it, yeah, it's a good moment. That's why I guess it's good to kind of like welcome a couple of our guests here. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so maybe I would like to invite um Tom. Are you there, Tom? Uh yes, I'm here. Hi Tom, how are you doing? I'm good, I'm very well, thank you. Yes, where are you now, man? Uh, I'm in Singapore. Okay, how's Singapore? Uh, rainy and uh, a big thunderstorm currently going on outside. Oh, really? Like here yeah. in Bali? Sorry, go on, <laughs> go on, Andrew. No, I just see that Tom is from Smooth. So uh, I think I, I, I knew your CTO before. Um, yes, uh, and I think uh, we also met like many years back. At, I think it was one of the pitching events uh, yes. many years back. And I, th I think yesterday, yesterday or the day before, I um, I saw your event posted on LinkedIn. And, uh, yeah. you know, I'm quite interested in like venture building and how you do that, uh, like on, a, on, on multiple levels, you know, how you multiply uh, certain things. So that's why I thought like, hey, this would be interested and Time was free. My daughters are busy right now, so uh, I was, uh, you know, happy to join today. Nice, yeah. very cool. I'd love to hear more after it's about smooth. Uh, it's I've followed you guys back in the days, but uh, you know, I, I'd love to hear more. Sure, sure. Happy to chat. Yes, welcome, Tom. Uh, I hope you. that you can learn something out of uh, the event today. Yeah. Sure, we'll do. For awesome. Sure. All Cheers. right. Um, I will invite one more, uh, one more guest to um, chat with us a little bit before we go on. Um, I saw one of our friends here. Um, hello, Kemoni Sen. Kemoni Sen. Hello. Hi. Hi, hi, hi. hi. You am can I... call me Moni. Ah, Moni. All right. I was about to yeah. ask, like, am I pronouncing your name right? <laughs> <laughs> hi, Moni. Right. How Thank are you, you. Moni? I'm um, doing great. Yes. And you? Uh, I'm doing amazing. <laughs> Good weather here actually in Bali. It's so hot, but right now it's getting better. Where are you right now? Uh, I'm currently in London. I'm here okay. for, for my school. Mm -hmm. So I'm a student. Okay, awesome. So yeah. if I may ask one question for you, like what would you expect like by coming into the events today? 
Um, I actually didn't come with a lot of expectations. Mm-hmm. I I honestly just just want to learn and and see what you guys are up to. I'm also doing my final project related to like starting up a new venture. So mm-hmm. this would be kind of like a new sort of insight to me. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm I'm open to learning. All right, of course. The idea of like us sharing and having this type of event in the beginning is for us to give a space for everyone to learn um, because I believe like in this world, there are a lot of amazing people that we can learn from anyway, right? And yeah, welcome yeah. Uh, welcome to the events today. I hope that you enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. All right. Awesome. Um, I guess um, since we already passed five minutes, I'm just trying to make it on time with all of our events. So Welcome everyone who just joined today. Um, so as you know that today we have Andres who will share his insights a little bit about venture building. So um, I'm pretty sure that there's a lot of takeaways that you're uh, going to get on this event. And if you have some question, uh, feel free to write it down on the notes first or just leave it on the chat, which we will cover later on after the end of the events. Just want to give, uh, before we before I give the floor to Andres, um, later on when we, have the, when we have the question and answer session, there would be awesome uh, if you can um, go to the reaction. If you, go, if you see your uh, Zoom, uh, Zoom app, at the moment, you will see the reaction right there, and then you can raise your hand so then I can get uh, I can get a notification that there is a question from uh, some of you guys. And then another uh, another thing for the technical thing, like just make sure to uh, mute yourself uh, during the presentation um, and just preparing all the uh, the question that you have. Uh, for later on at the end of the session, since we're going to have it. All right, sounds good, everyone. Okay, um, awesome. Andres, are you ready? Yes, I am. <laughs> okay, awesome. Thanks All for right. the energy. <laughs> yes, okay, I'll give the floor to Andrew. Please, everyone, welcome Andres. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for making it. Uh, it's a casual Wednesday. Uh, I'm currently based out of Bali at the moment. I just moved from Singapore a couple of months ago to sit out COVID here with my family. Uh, for the ones who are in Bali, I mean, Ubud, uh, hit me up uh, if you're coming by. Um, so uh, to, so just perhaps to start off, this is going to be very casual. Um, feel free to indeed ping questions there. This is not a formal workshop. I would also say the presentation, the way it was structured is a combination of different materials. So even the branding, I would say, is very informal. This is a community event. Yeah, this is not a corporate workshop. Uh, so to start off with that with that expectation, but I believe that the spirit of the event is, you know, it's about learning, it's about sharing. We have a lot that I would like to share and, and obviously we'll have, we'll, we'll have time for questions. I would say it's 40, 35, 40 minutes um, where I will share and then about 20 minutes or so Q&A, give or take. I think we have, we have up to an hour, right, Cash, till 7 p.m. Yes, Bali correct. time, Yeah, 7 p.m. Singapore time. Okay, um, great. So let me get started directly. And Cash, do manage me or interrupt me if there's questions there because I won't be able to see it. Sure, sure. So let me start by just saying a few words about myself. Um, my name is Andres. I'm the CEO of Slash, a venture builder. You can, li- you can link up with me on LinkedIn if you use this QR code. Um, I've done a number of startups myself, raised some money, uh, grew some companies, sold some companies, um, uh, had some experience with the good and bad of startups. And actually, the reason that Slash is set up the way it is set up to a degree is partially when, uh, because I felt that this was a more interesting model to set up my, my next venture. And, and we'll, we'll go into that history a little bit uh, to give you the philosophy of, of a venture builder. Um, just uh, 10 seconds more on Slash. Uh, Slash as a company has two studios. Uh, on one hand, so we're a software studio that solves tough, tough problems with technology and, and ventures. We have a venture studio and a build studio. The build studio builds things, products, and tech. The venture studio builds our own ventures. So we blend a, com- we blend a combination of strategy, startup, uh, design, research, product, and, and engineering all together. And typically, when we build startups, we take an, equi- an equity stake of 10 to 20%, but it depends a bit. There's some exceptions there as well. Uh, we've done now 15 startups in the last four years. Those startups have raised about 9 million USD. Uh, we have four offices in Singapore, where our headquarters are, Cambodia, Indonesia, uh, Bali, and Armenia. 
uh, with around give or take about 60 people now. Uh, and we've done besides it from the consulting side, we've done we've helped more than you know 50 clients build their products and their tech across different industries. Yeah. Um, besides the, some of the startups, I won't go into that now, um, but it's a variety of startups uh, in the mostly in the B2B space, uh, business to business SaaS products, some blockchain, some um, some deep tech, um, uh, different type of solutions, fintech that we build. We also have a podcast on, on uh, venture building that we started recently. Uh, feel free to subscribe. We're, we're, gonna, we're adding now um, about one episode a, a week to that podcast where, we're, where I'm interviewing different people in the venture building space because I'm trying to kind of codify the space because there's a lot of people that are interesting in this, but it's still early days and different people are sort of trying to wrap their heads around it. So it's, uh, it's early days and it's, it's, been, it's been quite interesting to see how people think about it. Uh, so it's it's fireside chats with uh, with different founders of venture builders as well as corporate innovators, digital transformation and corporate innovation. So let's talk about what we're going to cover today. Um, we're going to cover three topics: why venture building, uh, different types or flavors of venture building, and the venture building playbook. And then we'll have some Q and A. Okay. Um, okay. So let's start with section one: why venture building. So in my case, I'll start with a personal story. Back in 2015, end of 2015, I, um, I was growing another company. Um, uh, and I essentially, this company, this company is called Club Vive. It's still around in Singapore. It's a, it's a, it's a lifestyle business now for me. My wife and I own it. And we, were, we just closed a very large round of 45 million USD to go to China with that business. And then two weeks after signing the term sheet, my investor got a heart attack and I lost the deal. My syndicate fell apart. I didn't get the money. I was running out of money with that business. I had to put in everything I had to save it and make it profitable. And that was a very traumatic experience, as you can imagine. It's a kind of an experience where you think you have a great plan, but then things don't work out. And then you have to rethink your entire life. Um, that's what happened. Christmas 2015, I was depressed and I was thinking, okay, what's next? What do I do next? With my co-founder, with my uh, with my CTO at the time, Mark, who's now co-founder of Slash, we were debating what we could do, and we said, "Let's do the next startup together." And then we felt that we could maybe build a different model, um, uh, which became Slash for us, but a new model to build new businesses at scale uh, and to build a portfolio of businesses. That was our thinking, because my frustration was that if you could not get in within a very narrow band of investment, and if you failed in that in that in that specific fundraising. Uh, journey, you are very exposed as a single founder. And, uh, and that was something that was, that was very frustrating for me. Um, so I sort of looked at, at, a, at a different way of approaching it. So a startup studio or venture builder is really, is really a, a, a startup factory. I don't like the word, but it's very intuitive. It's something my mother would understand if I say startup factory. Um, it's a company that builds other companies. That's really what it is. And, um, and this is, you know, so it's a company of startups. It develops ideas into products and product into companies. So two steps, ID to product and product into companies. Yeah, and we'll come back to that team of the two steps. Um, now, this is not something that is um, new. This has been around for a long time in different forms and shapes in different industries. Take Hollywood as an example. Um, Hollywood is uh, in many ways, you know, Hollywood studios are in many ways like a startup studio. But they are instead of being the startup being a startup, it's a film, right, or a TV series, um, where you're taking a bet on an idea, you finance the idea, the script, the creative side, you turn it into a product, which is the movie in this case, and then you try to then commercialize that movie uh, with risk uh, risk capital to get it to a certain scale. Yeah, Hollywood has done this very well for now almost a century. Um, it's a different risk management model than venture capital. Uh, but they've done it quite well. Uh, it's complex. It has its own complexity. Now, this mindset has been developed and evolved and has evolved into the startup space as well, into different models. Um, some famous grads that comes out of this, in a way, are Twitter, Tumblr, Picasa, Zalora, Lazada. These are all just examples of Giphy, examples of companies that have essentially evolved out of some kind of venture building uh, methodology to then generate that startup that then became big. Yeah. And we've actually done research with our team. And I believe Nadine is, on, is I believe, on our call, um, who's heading the content for Slash. She's done the research for 300 venture builders globally. 
We have put this on a map, which you can go to slash.co uh, vb dash map at the top. It's still an alpha product. There's still lots of bugs in our product. So we're just playing with it right now. But basically we've tried to look at an interactive directory an, a free interactive directory of all the venture builds of the world. We've identified more than 300. As you can tell, there's a lot of concentration in Europe, um, quite a lot of concentration in, in the United States. Asia is growing, the rest of the world is still a bit behind. Uh, Singapore in Asia is one of the bigger ones. Uh, I suspect that China is underrepresented here on this map, and it has more to do with our, with our ability to research in Chinese, I believe. Uh, but at least uh, it shows that there is a lot of activity in that space. And that space is booming. Um, the problem with venture builder venture building right now, it's still a very emerging field. And as a result, there's no real unified definition of what a venture builder is. Uh, it's not codified yet. Yeah. So let's talk about the different types then. Yeah, we'll, we're entering sort of the second part of the talk. Um, so different types of venture builders. We have with our research identified four types. The first type is an operator-led model. Um, the operator is essentially a successful entrepreneur who has made his money and he's prepared to, he or she is prepared to invest X amount of money, let's say two, $3 million to build the next big thing. And that entrepreneur or that operator sets aside that money says, okay, I'm investing that. Rather than investing that in one company, I want to invest that in 10 and then see what works. Not investing them as a VC passively, a venture capitalist, but actively. So he wants to try, he or she wants to try multiple models. Just to be clear, whenever I say he, I also mean she. Yeah, just for simplicity's sake, I don't mean to be um, to be discriminating here uh, or to be uh, insensitive. Um, so uh, the operator uh, wants to build different startups and then see which startup is the best and then scale that. Yeah, the source of the funds for that for that operator is their own money. Yeah, that's the first model. Well, we'll talk a bit more in a bit more detail afterwards. The second model is the consulting-led model. It's a model where the consultancy wants to build a portfolio of startups, and they then want to they use the consulting cash flow and maybe a bit of their own money to cash flow the startups. The corporate-led model is where a big company, a big corporate, wants to build more products and services for the group, and the source of the funds is the corporate mothership, the big company. The VC-led model is where a VC wants to de-risk their portfolio of startups by providing hands-on support from specialists. And as a result, they are becoming a lot more hands-on rather than passive cash. The source of funds there usually is the limited partners of that fund. So these are the four high-level kind of categories, and we'll go into each of those in a bit more detail. So let's go into the operator-led model. So there the goal, find the next big startup, kill the rest, right, or, or, or spin it off. So as an example, the startup studio is here. And when I use startup studio, I mean venture builder or, or uh, venture studio. These are all synonyms in this context. Uh, the startup studio is here. The startups are below. And the idea is to build, to build multiple. And some of them will die by definition. And that's OK. But the idea is to hopefully get one that will not die and that will skip. So as an example of this, the origins of Twitter are kind of in that sphere. Twitter came out of, a, out of a pivot from another company called Odeo, which uh, was killed by iTunes, essentially. Uh, it was an audio, uh, audio type of company and, they, and, and iTunes essentially made them obsolete and they were, running out of, they were running out of money. And they were looking at different ideas they could do um, to salvage their assets. And Twitter came out of a brainstorm with their team. And then um, the rest is history, really, uh, in terms of how Jack Dorsey took it on. He then sold, he then bought off all the other shareholders and, and then you know, proceeded with that company. Slack, in a way, is a similar story for the ones who know Slack in Vancouver. They had a sort of a similar story, uh, a gaming company that's built their own communication tool. They were not set up with the intent of being a venture builder. So that's where it differs a bit. Uh, but ultimately, that's sort of where the bigger ID came out and won, right? Which is the philosophy of the operator led model. Let's take the second model, the consulting-led model. Slash is very much in that line. Um, so the idea there is to build a portfolio of startups and to use your consulting cash flow to finance it to a degree. So here you have two models. You have your clients and you have your startups. So it's already one more level of complexity compared to the operator-led model. And you want to launch you know, your next big scalable business. Um, so 
the problem with that model or the challenge of that model is that you are in a sense, in essence, operating two businesses in one. On one hand, you're operating a, um, you know, your day job as consultancy, which in this metaphor is Clark Kent, the, the journalist. And at night, you're operating the venture model, which is the, in this example, Superman uh, as a metaphor, where you're then trying to then build an exponential business, right? So this is quite challenging as an example of put slash, but you could put other, other logos of different models here. Um, in ideal world, you keep those two separate so that you can be Superman during the day and, and Clark Kent during the day in an ideal world. But that's not always possible if you don't have the scale or you don't have enough of the financing to do it. So there's a lot, there's a lot of examples in that model. Rainmaking is one of those um, for the ones who know rainmaking. In Singapore, they also have office in London, Denmark, and a few other places. Um, so they have been doing this for quite a while. They now have evolved from a consulting model to also provide venture capital. So they also have a fund now. Um, so that's so they have evolved their model uh, more and more. Uh, but so Rainmaking is a fairly uh, good example. You can check out their website. Another example is Mac49. They're firmly in the consulting space. They recently sold out to a large uh, UK player. Um, they're looking at being kind of like an incubator, but they're focusing on corporate venturing, which is a which is a slight variation of what we described here, which is where you help big companies build their startups. Um, and we'll talk about the third operator model there. But so Mac49 is a service provider for those big corporates. Yeah, they normally don't take equity. Sometimes they maybe have success fee or so, but uh, but uh, it's an exception. The problem with with this model is uh, how you commercialize your your business. Um, because one thing is building your product. The other thing is then actually making sure that you can grow that business into a full-fledged business. Can you do that in-house? If, if yes, then you need a big enough team. Uh, if you're a venture builder of 10 people as a consultancy firm, you probably won't manage to do that. You can, then can only focus on service, services. Slash is now getting to a stage where at around um, 60 people, we have more and more capability to provide in-house capability and support our own ventures to commercialize. But even there, 60 is still a fairly small number if you think of it. Think about it. Uh, the other way is that you go for joint ventures, um, which is where you partner with a commercial partner that is an equity stake to commercialize it, preferably a CEO, uh, which is the model we have tried a lot, where we have a CEO that works with us that has the idea we partner with them, we take a, we take a minority position in their business, and they are in the shower every day, standing with the monkey on their shoulder, with the stress on their shoulder of having to commercialize a business and we provide certain founder support services. Let's talk about the third model, the corporate-led model. The corporate-led model is, as the word suggests, is a model where the big corporate is uh, provided, it wants to build new products or services to their group, either uh, in their ecosystem, like indirectly, they want to future-proof themselves uh, by looking at building an entire new segment of products, or they're interested in, um, they're interested in, uh, in you know, building um, you know, add-ons to their existing ecosystem. The source of fund there is really the, the mothership, essentially the big corporate that will finance it. Um, so they, it's a bit in that sense, like a venture capital where they say, okay, we have X amount of money we set aside for this. Let's try and get something done. Now, the reason why corporates are interested in this and not just interested in this, the reason why corporates are existentially needing to look at this is because the nature of innovation is changing. As a matter of fact, my prediction is the next five or 10 years that corporate venturing, it will become massive. I saw that one of the people in this chat is Carlos, who works for McKinsey. Um, uh, sorry for calling out your name explicitly, but there is a lot of people in a consulting space that are not looking at these business models because they realize that this is the future. It's not anymore about selling decks, but it's about making interventions and, 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 um, and building new ventures. And so the entire space of consulting is also moving in this direction. And the reason is really fairly simple, is that in the 20th century, the playbook for a big corporate could be that you could be a market leader for decades. You build a working business, and then you can be a market leader for decades. You can expect that you'll, your business will, re, will, remain, will remain strong for many, many years to come. Now that's not the case anymore. Things move too fast. So the model for corporates used to be that you have this bowl, this, the hair bowl, this diagram here, which is like a hair bowl, <laughs> a cat hair bowl where there's the big corporate, where all the activity is in the core engine that makes the money. And that you then, at in, back in 10, 20 years ago, you would, then, you would then kick out someone that would then try to build some innovation on the fringes. They would kind of orbiting around this hairball. There's a book around this for the ones interested, orbiting around the hairball. 
um, that talks about this, where they would say, okay, okay, we will orbit around this giant role of the company. We will be focusing on Skunk Wars, merchant acquisition, R&D labs, innovation teams, but we are not part of the core of the team. By definition, we are in a corner. We're trying to come up with, with innovation. And then when we, we have the right innovation, we'll go to the hairball and say, okay, Mr. Hairball, take it over. This is what's called innovation by exception, this mindset, right? And to be fair, there has been some success stories in the space, but the success stories have been quite small compared to what's possible. Um, the, the B2 bombers came out of that. Uh, the park, the Palo Alto, the Palo Alto Research Center uh, from Park came out of that, which is a, which is a, one of the key companies behind Silicon Valley or behind sort of the ethos of Silicon Valley. Xbox came out of that for Microsoft. So there has been success stories of Skunk Works or R and D labs that go out there, build stuff, and come back, right? But the real, but the problem with that is it's a very slow model, especially because Skunk Works and or R and D labs they don't control the commercialization. They are really a product incubation. Uh, methods. And then you need to come back to the mothership to try and commercialize those products into real businesses. And the mothership sometimes reject those ideas, whether because they're, they're culturally not compatible with it, a bit like an organ, an organ donor, you get an organ, but your body rejects it. Uh, or because the, the politics don't align for it, or because there's no real entrepreneur inside a company can take it forward. Uh, the direction changes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Or the product is cool, but really the product, the, the validation to market is not quite there. Customers are not, re not ready for it. So by, by decoupling the product and the commercialization part, you are not in sync, which is why it's innovation by exception. The 21st century playbook is constant change by, by the nature of how, how innovation is evolving. It's constant change. This requires a move from innovation by exception to innovation by design or continuous innovation. This is a different way of working. It's a different methodology. It's a different um, operating framework. It's a different funding framework. And venture building can very much be seen from a corporate standpoint in that context. So for the ones who are in this call from a corporate standpoint, this is where this, this conversation becomes interesting for you. Because once you have, you, once you have control of R&D and commercialization, you're basically building a startup, broadly speaking. It's just that's part of a mothership of a large organization. So then it's about negotiating how much freedom you have as a startup to be able to be empowered and build a new product or service. So this is a summary of an article that we wrote, which you can find on our website, which maybe after this call, uh, Narine, you can send to uh, cash and cash can distribute it to the participants, uh, where we sort of summarized specifically this last, this last section on corporate on uh, innovation by design and by, by exception by design into an infographic where you would see that, you know, you have different drivers of innovation. And in a world of innovation by exception, these drivers are answered in a different way than innovation by design. For example, tech feasibility in a world of innovation by exception is very much focused on R&D departments and academic, whereas innovation by design is focused on rapid experimentation. In a tech, the tech ecosystem for innovation by exception is based on a world of environments. In by design, it's based on an open innovation environments. In Singapore, for example, you find a lot of open innovation um, uh, hubs around, you know, usually sponsored by a big corporate like Unilever, but, but there's more and more co-working space that want to be that open innovation hub. And large corporates want to set up an office in those hubs, um, not because of the office space, but because of the ecosystem, right? Uh, in the case of product insights, the world is moving from research driven to test driven. Uh, commercial viability is moving from separating the R&D and commercial to incubating a startup as a vehicle which is why venture building becomes so popular. Company culture is going from innovation being the responsibility of this spin-off group of people out of the hairball to making the whole hairball responsible for it. Innovation is responsible for everyone. So everyone in the company needs to be upskilled. Methodologies is, you know, a lot of the traditional consulting methodologies, um, which I won't go into now, are moving away to now more startup methodologies like lean, agile, business model, venture building. Partnerships, used to be more academic and government, now it's becoming also about startups, scale-ups, and corporates. And a measure of success used to be one of breakthroughs, now it's about speed and agility. So this is just to show you the, the degree of, tr of transformation that is happening in the world of innovation and how venture building is a, is a piece of that puzzle, but a, ba a big piece of that puzzle because it, it gives a, a clear vehicle to drive innovation in a future-proof manner, in a manner that could help us future-proof 
whether it's a new startup or, or a corporate. And as a matter of fact, the world is paying attention. A lot of big companies are doing exactly this. Uh, these are just a slide I could, you know, uh, logos I found online. Uh, you can put thousand companies here. There are so many companies now moving it, moving that space and trying to build their own things. Sometimes by building more venture cap, corporate venture capital. So that means they invest cash only, but more and more of them are, in, are starting to actually build their own solutions. The most famous one of all is probably uh, X from Alphabet or Google. The Google X uh, used to be Google X, now just called X. Um, you know, uh, they are probably most famous. They're trying to build moonshots. You can check out their website, you'll be inspired. So let's talk about uh, VC led um, venture building. So this is where a VC tries to de-risk their portfolio of startups by providing hands-on support from different specialists. The source of fund there is uh, typically limited partners yeah, as a, as a fund. Um, there's been quite a few players doing this. Um, there's uh, Rocket Internet probably being the most famous of all. So Rocket Internet has, been, um, has had quite a few success stories, beta cell of Germany. Those success stories include also in Asia. Uh, Lazada, for example, in Asia is a Rocket Internet story. Uh, they bought Red Mart recently. Um, and, uh, and Lazada itself was sold to, uh, to, uh, to Alibaba. Um, uh, but Rocket Internet has done this globally. Uh, so they're probably one of the more famous ones. They focus primarily on e-commerce and marketplace as, a, as, a, as sort of a, a category. Uh, but they had essentially a venture builder model before it was known that way. They were trying to build different startups with their model, but they also included, they had a lot of capital behind them. Another one is BetaWorks in New York, one of the oldest ones. They started actually as an operator-led model. They were building their own startups and then they became so big that they said, you know what, why don't we become not a VC? And we also invest and do, we, we support with some founder support, but we are providing a much bigger platform, right? So they're, they're probably one of the more known ones globally. Uh, then there's some very specific ones. I just wanted to give you that example. Um, oh, actually there's a spelling mistake. That's Jumanji with an N here. Uh, they're based out of Singapore. They're a small player, um, lovely people. Um, and they're building essentially a studio for uh, sustainable ventures. Um, uh, so climate change, plastics, uh, circular economy, those type of problems. And uh, they, have a, they have a small fund. They use the funds to build their own ideas. They don't invest in others necessarily. They, they are only building out their ideas where they take a significant stake, sometimes a majority stake, often a majority stake. Then they try to find a CEO uh, to then grow the business into something. They've done now five or so. And that model is quite interesting. And I, I suspect more and more uh, such models will, will, will evolve. So to recap, four different types of venture builders, uh, operator-led models, consulting-led models, corporate-led models, and VC-led models. Now, each type bring very different value adds to the founders or, or, to, the found, to, or to the venture. Sometimes they're more focused on the founder, sometimes more focused on the venture. In our research, we've identified around 14 areas of value add. These are the 14. Um, there are areas around IDs and founders. So whether the ID, whether the venture builder brings the ID or not. For example, a big corporate might bring the ID because they have a need in their ecosystem. Uh, market validation, so whether they are the ones validating the idea or not, uh, or helping you getting, the, getting customers to sort of validate the idea. Uh, co-founders, sometimes they, the venture builder can match you with other co-founders. For example, Antler, which is a famous um, accelerator, um, yeah, kind of an accelerator. Um, they are, you know, they have uh, offices in different countries, including in Singapore. Uh, Stockholm, London, Netherlands, a few other places, uh, New York, I think now as well, uh, South Africa. And they're basically now matching co-founders um, as well as bring cash. Then access, uh, it could be that it, it's the value add they provide to the founder or to the, to, the, uh, to the startup is more related to distribution. That means clients, uh, investors, or proprietary data. For example, big companies like telcos sit on a lot of very valuable data uh, they may not have the ideas on what to build, but they might have the data. So they might say, you know what, why don't we do this together? And we, as a venture, in a venture building uh, um, uh, mindset, and we'll give you, as a strategic partnership, give you these type of values, right? Uh, this, this kind of value add. Um, capital is another one, of course, cash or exit planning. Uh, for example, I know someone who specializes in giving companies exits in Japan, uh, very, very specific. Uh, they try to bring uh, international business to Japan and then give them an exit there. 
right? So there are ways to specialize in very specific uh, areas. Um, advisory is more kind of the traditional way that VCs would add value. So like strategic advisor, a different specialist in, uh, in hands-on functions. Operational support is, uh, you know, product and design, which is a lot of what Slash does. Software and build, also a lot of what Slash does. So more kind of basically product and engineering team. Growth and testing. Some venture builders focus more on the growth and testing side, so like the sales and marketing. And some focus more on business support, which is, you know, legal and finances and like, you know, being the CFO and those type of things. So as you can tell, there's very, very many ways how you can get support from venture builders. You just have to ide identify what you need and what those venture builders provide. And then whether you have a fit and a chemistry with those venture builders. Um, and then also, of course, how much value they want, how much equity they want for that, uh, you know, how serious they are, you know, et cetera. So um, I'll stop there for a second um, because I've been speaking nonstop for about 20 minutes already. How um, am I making sense? Everything clear so far? I'm kind of looking at cash as well. Yes. You have maybe reading of the room. Yeah, yeah. So maybe if you guys are okay for us to move forward, you guys can say, um, like, write it on the chat. Click, uh, just say why. Um, yes, good for Hagen, uh, for an example. Um, if, everyone, if everyone feels okay for us to move forward, yeah. Great. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you. So I'll just, I'll just continue sharing then. So, okay, we'll go now a little bit more in nitty gritty. So for some of you who are less familiar with uh, product and tech and venture building, this is where I might lose you. I give you that as a warning. Um, I hope I won't lose you. But to be fair, what I'm going to go into is a bit more complex. Uh, everything's up to date with more macro strategy, you know, market insights uh, and conceptual. Now it's a little bit more, we go a little bit more into mechanics. Um, and I also have very little time. So this is really much of the introduction session. Uh, so I'll cover, I'll take another 10 minutes and I will open Q&A. So I'll just whiz through this uh, to plant the seeds in your head. Uh, and hopefully in the Q&A, we can go into some details. And if there's really an interest, maybe we can run another session on some details, okay? Um, so as I said, we're scratching the surface, it's complex. So let me just start with the basics. Life is too short to build something nobody wants. Yeah, let's make that a statement that I think should be on the wall of every entrepreneur. Um, but really, as an entrepreneur, you only have two jobs. Or as a, as a startup, you only have two jobs. Find a solution user wants and get many users. You know, forget all the books you read. That's all fine and well. But ultimately, it comes boils to those two things. If you find a solution user wants and get many users, you're good. You're fine. So if you can do that through your own framework, good for you, right? Now, there are frameworks out there that help you to do that. And there's a lot of very, very, very smart people that are probably smarter than you and smarter than me that have figured this out, right? So it's helpful to learn from the best and then and also codify the space, right? So I'm going to focus primarily on the first part of this job, find a solution user wants. I, won't, I will talk less about get many users because that's a whole talk on itself, yeah? So to get to build a solution many users want, you need to hire a product or a service to get a job done, right? So again, you need to hire a product or a service to get a job done. As an example, you want to listen to music. That's the job you want to be done. So imagine back in the days, 1,500 years ago, 3,000 years ago, even in ancient times or, uh, or, uh, or archaic times, you could, you could listen to music by having a live concert, by having some musicians play. So your, your, your job was answered through live concert. Then, you know, two, 300 years ago, 200 years ago, I guess, vinyl records, 1800s or so, came out and you could listen to an LP. Then, you know, a couple of decades ago, the CD came out. Then like 15 years ago, 2006, iTunes came out with MP3s. Now a couple of years ago, five years ago, Spotify came out. These are all evolutions of the same problem you're trying to solve, listening to music. They're just gradually better and better and better solution, arguably, although private concert provides a different experience than Spotify, yeah? but well, let's not go into that. So the point here is that a job is something that is solution agnostic. It's regardless of the solution, a problem or job exists out there. Your job as entrepreneur is to find the job to be done and then solve it with the right solution. Many of those jobs, by the way, remain valid over a long time because of human nature. That might change once we become more bionic and with more chips in our, in our, in our, in our body. But right now, we're still very much homo sapiens. So for now, let's assume that most of these jobs will stay the same. 
So from a point of view of a customer, the customer wants to hire, has a job and wants to hire a solution. There's another example of brushing teeth, you know, having a fresh breath, feeling fresh, preventing caries, that's a job to be done. Different solutions could be about toothpaste, chewing gum, tooth cleaning, right? So let's take that framework and let's talk about venture building. From the point of view of venture building, really there is three phases to building a startup. The first phase is validating the concept of what you're trying to do. What is the problem? What is the concept? Does that concept make sense? Would users want, to, want you to build that? Would they want to come if you build it? That's the first part. The second part is then to build a product out in all its detail, sell it to customers and see that people love it and want to keep on coming back and you can grow it. That's product market fit, which there's a lot of books written about. And the third piece is scale up, which is then, okay, once you have this, can you scale it up, right? To millions of users or to multiple markets if you're only active in Singapore, et cetera, et cetera. So let's talk about concept validation. We'll primarily focus in the remaining five minutes on these two, yeah? And concept validation being probably the most important. So how do you validate a concept? Well, a concept or an idea, right? You have an idea, you want to get honest feedback, and then hopefully you build a startup. That's that's the idea, right? That's the, that's the gist of it. So you want to get to a validated idea so all the money can come to you. Really, that again, that's where we want to get to. You want to validate a concept that allows you to hook up customers. How do you do that? Well, you first need to be very clear on the problem you're solving. Then you need to be very clear on how you solve it with different concepts. And then you need to validate that the, that the solution you've conceptualized and designed is indeed the right solution for those users. That's it. That's the three steps. Now, how do you do problem research, which is the first step here? Well, that requires you to use design thinking. Design thinking is a methodology that has been out there. There's uh, a lot of books written about it. It's complex. It's powerful. Uh, it can take weeks or months. Um, I, for the ones who don't know about it, I recommend you read more about it. It's fascinating. I won't have much time to go over in great detail in this workshop about it. Um, uh, but it comes down to understanding what was called empathizing with your customer, then defining their problem, ideating solutions around it, prototyping a solution, and testing with the solution. Those five steps, right? And how do you def how do you then try to empathize and identify and define a problem? Well, you have a whole bunch of artifacts and methods around surveys, interviews, shadowing a customer, desk research, work artifacts, diaries. There's, there's a lot of different solutions out there to be able to empathize with a customer and define their problem. Now, can you simplify this as a startup? Because if you don't have an army of people working for you, can you do this you know, on the cheap? You can, but it comes with compromises. Because going through this exercise of a few weeks of design thinking, is very valuable. You can get very nuanced um, uh, inputs, but maybe you only want to do some a few days of work on design and trying to validate. The, the question really is, comes down to a, a question of speed. If you want to research over a period of a few days or a period of a few months, it, you know you will get a different output. If you do a very detailed research, you will get more insights. It will take longer. It will be very research centric, and that's usually very good for very complex problems where there is heavy regulation, there is a large investment of capital required to build a problem, and it's a very complex, very novel new idea. When you are working on ideas that are simpler, um, maybe you can do a smaller sample size of customers to test it with, and then maybe 60 to 80 percent of the insight is enough, a few days of work, maybe one or two weeks, and become very test-centric. It's just a different philosophy of how to try and get the same accomplished. It comes down to a choice of where useful information comes from for you. Does useful information come from, from a point of view of prototyping, uh, you know, like user testing, or from a lot of research? And just to be clear, with research, you also do prototyping, but where there's a bit more emphasis on the research. I would argue most startups can are probably fine with, with uh, the earlier, with the first method, which is shorter, but the later method can obviously be used, but it's typically big corporates use it to have more peace of mind, and they're prepared to invest a lot more money in that research. So there are different, uh, very practical methods to do that. Um, you know, there's just prototyping stuff. It's an example of a tool we've prototyped at Slash. Just starting building something, showing what you build. You know, very kind of hackers base. You know, you know, Facebook style. I hack something. I ask my friends, hey, can you check it? Do you like it? Oh, look, I can raid girls on on a on a on a on a, on a, on a web screen. That sounds like fun. You keep on doing it, and then you you have Facebook eventually, right? That's kind of the the famous story. This can be done in prototyping. 
Um, but usually you need a little bit more insight. Hackathons can do that. Hackathons are where in a couple of days time, you, you have some insights, you come together with a group of people, you, you build it. Maybe the, after the hackathon, you do like a slightly more detailed, uh, detailed work with the same team over a period of one, two weeks. The other approach is what we do a lot at Slash, which is more rapid research and prototyping, where we take uh, four to eight weeks, uh, where we go over a degree of research, a degree of desk research and, and workshops, and eventually start prototyping. But then you can go for the, the final stage here, which is a lot more detail, which is what we call ethnographic research, and then prototyping out of that, where you spend a lot of time in the field. You can maybe spend you know 12 weeks doing very detailed interviews with hundreds of people, and then you have a very nuanced picture of, of who they are, right? So it comes down to which approach is right for you for what you're doing as a venture builder or as a startupper, right? Uh, here in prototyping, you leverage your own brief, you do rapid testing. In Hackathon, you have a collaborative process. It's still fast. In rapid research and prototyping, you have some original insights. Ethnographic research, you do deep nuance research, right? But obviously, you know, I, my ethnographic friends would tell me that, you know, it's all about culture. You need to do uh, ethnography. That's probably true if you can afford it and if the problem that you're solving makes sense in that context. But sometimes ethnography can also lose yourself in the details. So to summarize, concept validation is a lot of different things. It's about problem research, which is the bulk of what we've spoken about. There's a lot of stuff here we haven't spoken about because we don't have time, but it's about finding the motivation and behaviors of a user, prototyping those personas, prototyping concepts, customer journeys, testing it, validating them with customers, planning your venture on the commercial side, uh, building a design brief for the build, and then defining your MVP. That then brings you, hopefully, to the second stage. Once you have a concept, it says, you know what? I think we have a, a good problem to solve here, and we have several concepts or a concept, a winning concept that our users say, we like it, we will use you if you do it. That's when you can go to the next step, where you actually start building a product in detail and commercialize it, which is called product market fits. This, take, this phase can take everywhere from six months to two years or three years for very complex products. Um, but usually it means building a product and testing with the market until you have a fit, yeah? And that's where all the lean startup methodologies come in. And, and for the ones who know, there's not a lean startup um, uh, workshops. So I won't go too much into it. But the broad philosophy is that you build something, you measure, and you learn from it. After you've learned, you then rebuild, you improve the build, you measure again, et cetera, et cetera. And you do this in cycles until you get better. And typically, the building unit there, the unit of value is the MVP, the minimal viable products, which is usually very simple. And it's just to test out with paying users, typically. Once they're happy and they say, okay, if you add on my hamburger, you add, a, you add a tomato and ketchup, I'll be even happier. That's when you build a better product, right? That's the philosophy. And there's different ways to build MVPs, uh, which again, goes deeper into MVP process. Usually you build an MVP as something that actually adds value. So for example, if your MVPs are on transportation, you start with skateboard and you end up with a car. You don't start with a wheel and then end up with a car. You try to directly have something that a user can be happy with, right? And ultimately, the other, piece to, all the other piece to bear in mind is that if you're Mario Bros, really the product you're selling is not just a mushroom to make Mario Bros bigger, but you're selling the dream. You're selling the idea that the, the, Mario, the bigger Mario Bros as an identity is something cooler for Mario Bros, because that's really the motivation the, that touches on the psychology of what you're selling as a product. So it's important that you kind of bear that in mind in how you build and how you find product market fits, but also how you sell it, which we won't go into now, but there's a lot of philosophy around how you sell it. So to summarize many different concepts here, you need to build a product, you need to, uh, need to build a de design a product, you need to build it from a coding standpoint, you need to go to market with it, you need to find your first customers, typically your first 100 customers, you need to launch your venture, you need to validate your model, to validate your, your value proposition, you need to fundraise, build a team, and many more. That's where you get into the nitty gritty of actually building a company, right? And then ultimately, once you have that, you can scale, right? We won't go into that too much, but scaling up basically means a lot more money, a lot more teams, a lot more product development, a lot more incentives for your team, building a sales and marketing machine and many more concepts. Yeah. So I'm running out of time for, oh, well, I've, I'm coming to the end of, of, the, of the talk uh, and we'll open up for Q&A. I sort of covered the why of venture building. I covered sort of the type of venture building. I covered the venture building playbook, at least at a very high level. Uh, we focus a lot on concept validation and a little bit on MVP and, and, and product market fit. So that's sort of the, the gist. Um, if we have a few more hours, we can cover a lot more. Uh, so I'll open the floor for questions. 
All right, awesome. Thank you so much, Andres, for sharing. Um, all right, for some of you who have some uh, some question, please leave a comment on the chat box. Uh, you can put the question right there, and then later on, Andres will answer, and I will help on facilitating. Anyone have question? Or if you would like to uh, talk to Andres right away, you can also uh, unmute yourself um, and then ask the question right away. Uh, yeah, I have a question, uh, Andres. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, you have, uh, what is it, like 15, 15 companies in the portfolio right now? Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, I mean, 15, obviously that sounds a lot, right? For anyone that has built a company before, uh, and you, you mentioned, uh, you know, you, you and yourself, uh, you and another co-founder, um, you, you, you have the two like entrepreneurs in the company. Um, we now, and, we're now three, uh, but all yeah. three. Yes. We, but, we brought in a third one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, but, uh, you know, these, these 15 companies, are they currently run like separate entities or some of them are closer to like, okay, right now they're just separate products rather than being complete entities or companies already. And then depending on your answer, I want to know how it is further down the line. If you raise external money, um, you know, allocating the time of the entrepreneurs to each of those units or business entities. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, so th there is a, uh, a variety of models there as well. In our case, um, the bulk are the bulk of the, the originating the originating event for those ventures typically is an entrepreneur that we like with an idea and then we partner with them. As a result, they setting up this set is up as a separate brand with a separate cap table, a separate funding, separate mission, and we take a minority equity position between ten to twenty percent typically. Uh, so for each of those, we have. We have between five to fifty percent, actually, for, for each of those. But the bulk would be between ten to twenty percent. Uh, but these are separate; these are registered companies. You can look them up. And uh, the exception would be a good, a good, a good example of, of an exception would be Trust Eight. This one we're going to kill, actually, and that is not yet a separate entity. And uh, we're actually we will kill it because it's not worth setting up as a separate entity. We then have another one which is not on this slide, which is currently still in the in the oven, so to speak. It's still being baked. Um, and that will all being well be registered as a separate entity quite soon, uh, which is a mobile game. Um, but so we have, uh, uh, most of those are indeed separate entities. Uh, at what point in time did they become separate entities is a little bit a uh, contextual, I would say. It depends really on what level, at what point in time do we come in, uh, how ready the founder is, how much money there is, et cetera. Um, so uh, so it, every story is different, I would say. There's not one uh, template. Let's, um, but most of those, and and also we usually don't come in when we do, we I mean we don't come in if they're not serious essentially right so uh, we in that sense we we treat it like any strategic investment or an angel investment we look at to go to market at the you know at uh, at at their um, the chances of success uh, for for that equity to be worth something so we treat it very, we don't treat it like as a VC we don't have that criteria uh, we don't need a hundred x return. Uh, we also don't have a fund, right? So we have a slightly different approach. It's our own money. Um, but we are looking at, um, uh, obviously, we are looking at above average returns uh, in the long term. But we are very comfortable if that company will become, as a B2B SaaS product, for example, just a very good free cash flow generating business. Let's say a 20, 30, 40 million dollar business with a free with a good free cash flow genera generation, right? And then it ultimately can be sold. It doesn't have to, you know, do a VC or die roadmap. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, it does. Thanks a lot. And um, uh, another question, um, you mentioned you have your consulting business, right? I think uh, one thing that came to my mind was, uh, would there be a potential conflict of interest? But you just mentioned that your portfolio companies are mostly driven by external entrepreneurs first, rather than you yourself generating those ideas. But uh, your your consulting projects are they also in the venture building space or? or um... they are, it's a mix. It's uh, it's mostly around digital transformation okay. or software development or product design. Of course, we use venture building in as a as a broad um, 
I would say it's a it's a playbook, right? It's a playbook mm -hmm. that we tap into uh, in whatever work we do, even software engineering. The fact that we have that playbook allows us to be, I think, a better partner, software partner, uh, or a better product partner, or a better digital transformation partner, right? So it's for us in that sense, it's a it's a philosophical underpinnings of the company. Um, and as a matter of fact, most of our clients on the consulting side, um, uh, they choose us partially because of that, right? Mm. Because they feel that we are we are very differentiated from um, from you know another uh, another uh, consulting firm that we can work with, and we're boutique. Um, but coming back to the conflict of interest question, it's a great question. Um, we haven't really had that issue yet. Uh, I mean, there are situations where some of the uh, clients that we help have are in a similar space as some, one of our own ventures, in which case we pass it by our ventures to, clo to, to indeed confirm that they're comfortable that we take it on. And we try to identify early on with the client, as well as with our, the CEO of that venture, that indeed both parties are comfortable with it. So this is more of an integrity question. It's a bit like McKinsey. I use the McKinsey example because you know I know someone of McKinsey's here, but a typical example of a, of a big consulting firm would have the same, right? They try to keep uh, the practice area separated. So from an integrity standpoint, so we would have sometimes the same problem, but we're small players. So we don't have that problem quite often yet. Um, I suspect that problem will come more often. We are now building our own startups as well, 100%, uh, where, we are, where we have 100% equity stake and where we try to down the road attract the right CEO. As a matter of fact, we're now hiring two CEOs for our own startups. Um, uh, hiring, basically, we're not just hiring, we're looking for a partner, right? We're looking for someone who is prepared to step into the vesting, uh, into an equity stake uh, over a period of time. Um, so, and this is frankly the hardest part of our, of our job, I would say, uh, because finding the right CEO and then making that work with that CEO is potentially a make or die for that business. So it's a very high risk uh, undertaking. Um, but we feel that we are getting better at this. So we are experimenting with how we can bring on board the right CEOs. Uh, and of course, if we're building our own startups and our own CEOs in that startup, you could argue that we could always steal ideas of clients and then it's conflict of interest. We haven't had that problem yet. We haven't had that temptation yet. Uh, uh, my, my very practical response to that is that it's freaking hard to build a startup. And unless you have a very deep passion for a startup, you're probably gonna fail. Um, uh, so stealing an idea of one of our clients, frankly, is, um, I, I just don't see that as, as being very, very likely. <laughs> Plus, of course, we have IP contracts and everything, right? But that's on the legal side, but purely practically speaking, it just not, doesn't make sense. Okay, got it, thanks a lot. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, Tom, uh, for asking. Uh, do we have anyone who have uh, some more question? Uh, you can unmute yourself or you can also just leave uh, the question through the chat box. Um, as what we told mentioning uh, as well on the chat box after this session, is it possible to have video record or sample deck? Yes, uh, we will send a follow-up email after this, uh, after the events. Uh, maybe it will go out tomorrow. And uh, on there, you can get the uh, deck of this presentation on there. So yeah. All right. Um, do we have any more question uh, from our uh, audience today? <laughs> I think I confused uh, you. I, yeah, I have a question. Hello. Awesome. Uh, familiar Hello. Face. <laughs> yes, that's me. Hi, everyone. I'm Nareen. I'm the head of content of Slash. And Andres, my question is um, maybe about uh, resources that we can recommend to everyone, those people who are new in this space. Uh, any books uh, or are other kind of resources you would recommend them to start <laughs> looking at? Yeah, thanks. It's a great question and shame on me. I didn't put a slide on this. Uh, thank you. Um, there are resources and I'll, I'll send some for follow up afterwards that we can maybe send to the deck. Um, I think the, I mean, let, first of all, shameless plug for our podcast, uh, one resource. Um, uh, so that's that's one resource where we talk about methodologies. There's also a blog against this. You go to slash.co, uh, then slash hack. That's our blog, and there's some resources there. But obviously, we are just a small player. Um, and, uh, and we're building a venture builder map as, a, as another tool around that. Um, there are more and more um, resources coming out, but it's still very, very fragmented. For example, INSEAD had a, a released a large study on venture building. 
uh, quite recently. Um, I know, Tom, for example, you're part of INSEAD, so you might see there. Uh, then there is a, uh, there's also a book that came out about two years ago, uh, or no, three years ago, I think 2018, uh, which is called The uh, Corporate Startup. Um, and we will we'll put that up in, you can, if you Google it, The Corporate Startup, um, you will probably find it. Um, but we, we can put it in as a, in a follow-on message as well. Uh, it's a book that talks about um, how big corporates are starting to apply some of those methodologies. Um, and then uh, that, that's, I think, already a few resources. Um, if I just go to the Venture Builder map, let me just pull up that slide here. Uh, hold on, this one. Um, if you go there, you will find that there is, uh, the, 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 the interface is still very buggy, but you will already be able to filter and search on the left with the left side panel. You'll be able to find 300 companies there with their link by continents, by country, by city, actually. So you, you'll be able to, and by sector, you'll be able to kind of browse straight because you also get a lot of information from their blogs and from those companies. Um, uh, EDB in Singapore, the Economic Development Board of Singapore is releasing some materials on this, I think this week, as a matter of fact, they're launching a program on this that we've been in touch with with them on. They, they were launching some materials on this. So also follow up the Economic Development Board of Singapore because Singapore is going to push, is going to educate the market around corporate venturing and around venture building. Um, so this is something that is coming. It's not just players like us, you know, it's it's the government of Singapore, right? Which means something, yeah, as you can imagine. Um, uh, other resources, um, let me let me. I can't come on it immediately right now, uh, but I'll, I'll I'll drop a line to to you, Nadine, and 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 uh, and uh, and Cash to put it in the follow up uh, message for everyone. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Andres. Thank you, Narin, for asking the question. Um, all right, I guess uh, right now, as we see, uh, guys, we already uh, seven p.m. Bali time and also Singapore time. So I guess this is the last uh the last time <laughs> before we say goodbye to everyone uh but thank you so much everyone for uh joining today event um as what we tell you uh before we will send you a follow-up email uh hopefully with all the resources as well coming up um before i close as well i just want to leave something on the chat box um so as you can see uh feel free to connect with us through linkedin um we also have our events coming up uh at huck so you can check on that website for more events uh and feel free to reserve your spot um and it would be awesome to see all of you again here um and yeah uh it's it's great to see everyone here um i hope that everyone learned something by joining this event today and i hope that well i believe that you do <laughs> there are a lot of information coming up from andre so i hope that's all very beneficial for all of you guys so i guess that's all thank you so much everyone for joining um for today's event at um yeah at huck so thank you so much everyone and i'll see you thank all you. soon bye <laughs> thank you everyone thank you bye <laughs>